Imagine a young girl being excited about going into her senior year of high school. A talented athlete, popular in real life, but also online, with a social media following of over 10,000 people. But then the unthinkable happens. She vanishes without a trace. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. But before we get into the video, I want to thank our loyal sponsor for today, and that is Dipsy. The holidays are around the corner, and I know that we tend to focus our time and our energy on others, but we neglect ourselves. I'm guilty of it for sure. I don't do yoga or meditation. For me, it's listening to stories. That is what relieves my stress. And if you're here today watching this video, I'm sure that you can relate. Stories are an escape for me. They transport my mind to another world where I can relax and treat myself to anything that my mind has the power to create. And our loyal sponsor for today is once again Dipsy, which is one of my favorites. It's an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women and I like that. Dipsy stories are the best of many worlds. You can listen to the most soothing voices take you away to another time and place. But there's more. Research shows that sex is as mental as it is physical, and I'm all about the science behind feeling my very best. Dipsy can help bring out a whole new world of fantasies in a brand new way. These stories bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters like this one about a couple in love just spending a sexy night in, cooking, and hanging out. I want you to listen to a sample. I took his hands, guiding them to my waist as we backed up to the counter. I hopped up, my ass right on the edge, and he planted his hands on both sides of me. He kissed up the inside of my arm, taking his time, glancing up at me as he brushed his mouth across my collarbone, smiling just a little. We could hang in the bedroom. Yeah. Or... Or... What? And we can stay right here. I like that idea. Um... Yes, it is a very fun to listen to these stories and check that story out and more on Dipsy. There is something for everyone. Dipsy is radically inclusive. They say that their stories are for straight and queer listeners and over half of the stories are voiced by people of color. And to me, that means that we can all find something relatable, either a story or the characters in them. And I really like that a lot. But I also like to explore things that I'm not familiar with. Dipsy also has soothing sleep stories, a wellness section, and sexy stories that you can read instead of listen to. New content is released every week, so I am always finding something new between listening to my favorite stories again and again. You can always find something new to explore. Let Dipsy be your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, relax, unwind, or heat things up with a partner. Dipsy is offering all of you an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Kimberlea. I'm gonna put it up on the screen here. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash Kimberlea. Thank you once again to Dipsy for sponsoring me and my channel and making today's video possible. Now, let's get into the story for today. For today's case, I'll be taking you to yet another small town. This one is in Virginia. And by the way, for my very last video, I actually went out to the neighborhood where the story took place. I was able to get my own footage of the home that the victim used to live in and take you around the town. And that has been a dream of mine. Where someone came from, where they lived and who they are mean so much to me. My goal for 2023 is to be able to go out to some of these towns that I'm talking about in these videos and get my own videos because painting the most accurate picture of these victims is my passion. And that's why my sponsors are so important because they make things like that a possibility and you are also very pivotal in me being able to do what I do. And all you have to do is watch. My job is to bring you the content and I hope that I can continue doing so. So thank you so very much. Now to Virginia, Lovingston, Virginia to be exact. But in order for me to take you there, we have to go back to Charlottesville, Virginia on June 5th, 1996. That's the day that Alexis Tiara Murphy was born to her mom, Laura Ann Murphy, and her father, Troy William Brown. Alexis has three brothers, Avery and Cameron Murphy, and Noah Thompson. Ultimately, Alexis and her mom moved about 40 minutes away from Charlottesville to rural Lovingston, Virginia, and lived with Laura's parents, Gail and Tony Taylor. 
Now this town had a population of about 520. Here's what it looks like on the map. We can see a couple of churches, a market, some coffee shops, a bookstore, a library, and it looks as though McDonald's is the only or the main fast food restaurant in that area. Other than that, there are just a small number of homes scattered throughout the area and nothing but nature after that. And it was okay because if anyone needed more than what this area had to offer, they could go to Lynchburg, Virginia, which was about a 35 minute drive. And Lynchburg is a major city. It has everything that you would expect from a big city. But Lovingston was fine for Alexis and her family. They were very close. And as a matter of fact, she spent a lot of time with her two aunts, Angela and Trina. They were almost like big sisters to her, but Alexis grew up with so many cousins and they were so close that her cousins were actually like siblings. She was also still close to her father, Troy. The family would frequently get together for birthdays, holidays, and any other reason they could find to throw a good party. Alexis was well taken care of. She had a very strong support system in her family as well as her close-knit community in Lovingston where everyone knew one another. They were always there to lend a helping hand. And Alexis grew up to be a happy, smiling little girl. She was always laughing, running around, having fun. And Alexis was also very beautiful. Everyone could see that. When I first saw her, I thought, wow, that is one of the most beautiful girls that I have ever seen. And there's just something special about Alexis. And as she grew up, she grew into a gorgeous young lady and she was very popular. She excelled in sports and by high school, she was one of the most valuable players on her volleyball team. I have to say that I learned so much about Alexis. I could talk about her for hours. There were just so many things I really loved learning about her. Most of all, I think it was her humor. By the time Alexis was 15 and attending Nelson County High School, she, like many other teenagers her age, was really into social media. I think it's only gotten more popular for younger people to get online at a younger age. I know it's true for my 11 year old and boundaries are so important. Alexis's platform of choice back then was Twitter. She wasn't just a casual user. She would tweet multiple times a day and sometimes multiple times an hour. She wouldn't just post updates sharing her thoughts. She would post pictures, videos, quotes, and surprisingly, at least for me, she was making her own memes back then. She started her account in 2010, but I could only go back to about 2012. And I went back through as many of the over 55,000 tweets and replies that Alexis had on her Twitter to get to know her from her own words and her own thoughts. She's been one of my favorite, if not my favorite person to get to know out of any of the videos I've done. I like when someone has an online footprint because there's so much to gain so much insight. I don't have to solely rely on what other people say when I can see it for myself. I wasn't the only one that enjoyed Alexis's tweets because by 2013, she had gained a following of about 11,000 people. And that is a lot by the standard back then, especially for the average everyday teenager her age. Usually someone like her in a town like hers maybe had 50 or 100 followers and it was people they knew in real life, but not Alexis. Her Twitter just blew up. I think having more followers can fuel this inclination to post more because sometimes it feels like there's an obligation to entertain people who choose to give you that follow. And then I realized, me realizing that our online presence may one day be the only thing we leave behind is a little bit scary. Since there's also the thought, is this person portraying their real self? We know how much a social media can be contrived. And I think it's gotta be a mixture. Alexis opened up a lot on Twitter. She would share sketches that she made, pictures of herself in cute outfits, and even a new piercing. She already had her nose pierced, but on December 3rd, 2012, she showed off a new Monroe piercing. It's the one in the upper lip that's supposed to emulate Marilyn Monroe's beauty mark. She had a diamond stud put in, and I think it looked really good on her. Her username was the Real Forlaren, and this intrigued me, so I looked it up, and this is the last name and the title of the eighth mixtape by an American rapper named Wale Forlaren. It was released on December 24th, 2012. The mixtape features guest appearances from Rick Ross, 2 Chains, Scarface, Nipsey Hussle, just to name a few, and Alexis was a big fan of not just music, but Wale's music. She would frequently post song lyrics, and she would even sing in videos on her posts. Her favorite song by Wale was Love Hate Thing, and it's really good. I listened to it, and there was this one line 
that stuck out to me. And sure enough, I wasn't surprised that it was one of Alexis's favorites too. She posted it here. They're gonna love you a little different when you're at the top. It's very true. Alexis wanted to be on the top too. She had a lot of dreams. By the summer of 2013, Alexis was 17, going into her senior year of high school. She was the captain of her volleyball team, number nine, and she dreamed of playing at the college level. She also liked basketball and softball, but at 5'9", she excelled in volleyball. That was her sport, and she loved it. Maybe it had something to do with some of her teenage angst because she definitely had some. And I know she was kidding, but she followed up her post about loving volleyball with this. It says, I just want to hit girls in the head with volleyballs all day. None of us go through life without getting upset, frustrated, and annoyed. And Alexis went through all of those emotions, but she celebrated more than she complained. And when she did complain, it was the usual things like having to get up early, go to work, a guy ghosting her, not finding a guy to commit, people only talking about her looks, the things that a normal teenager would complain about, and rightfully so. Alexis celebrated a lot of things that she loved. She loved food. Who doesn't? Her favorite places were Subway, McDonald's, and Starbucks. She also liked Chinese food, and she talked about craving it a lot. The cutest thing I saw on her Twitter was related to Starbucks. She tweeted, let me find out that they have a Starbucks inhaler. <laughs> yes, please let me know. Because I can definitely say with confidence, I am a Starbucks lover, a Starbucks addict. It's what got me through grad school and it's what gets me through these cases for you. Caffeine is my drug of choice. Alexis tweeted, why is Starbucks my weakness? It's definitely mine too. I smiled so many times going through her tweets. Alexis was very mature for her age. She was very intelligent. She was outgoing. She loved to dance, enjoyed getting her hair done, liked makeup, and dreamed of driving a Range Rover. She enjoyed bidding on things on eBay, but didn't like to be outbid, and I can relate. If she couldn't get her Starbucks fix, she would opt for a McDonald's frappe. After all, that was the closest fast food restaurant. She would go there every single day, but not for the food, for the fun, yes, McDonald's. The one in her area was actually connected to a gas station. It was called Liberty Gas Station, and it became a local hangout for teenagers in Lovingston. There weren't many places for them to go after school or before school, so they would hang out at the McDonald's and the gas station. But there were times she didn't mind going to Lynchburg for a craving. For example, she would drive there for a pretzel, and her dad would let her borrow his white 2003 Nissan Maxima. Alexis was a very trustworthy, she was responsible, so her dad had no problem letting her take the car anytime she needed it. However, she did have a nightly curfew. She had to be home by 11 p.m., and she never missed her curfew not one time. That is how reliable Alexis was. Another thing people knew about Alexis is she never went anywhere without her white iPhone. If they would have had pink, I could guarantee you Alexis would have chosen pink. That was her favorite color. But if there was something else you could rely on when it came to knowing Lexus, it's that she would not let her phone die. She would carry around an extension cord just so it would stay charged. Her aunt would make jokes about it all the time, that she would hear Lexus coming by the sound of her slippers shuffling across the floor and the extension cord dragging behind her. Alexis was the type of girl who would talk to kids that no one would talk to in school. She was loving. She enjoyed listening to others and giving honest advice when she could. She absolutely adored her three brothers, even though they annoyed the heck out of her sometimes. And she cared about others. She cared about things like the Columbine High School shooting. She posted this on April 20th, 2013. It says this is the 420 that really should be remembered, referring to the massacre that happened in Colorado on April 20th, 1999. And speaking of 420, I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. Yes, it seemed like she liked smoking weed. If I'm wrong, I apologize, but I'm only taking what I found from Twitter and making my observations. This is going to become something that's talked about, so I figured I would get it out of the way. She frequently posted about wanting to smoke and would post pictures and videos of her smoking. And there's still quite a stigma when it comes to marijuana, so take it as you will. From everything I read, Alexis was a normal teenager from a small town. She had big dreams, was inspired by music that emphasized the ability to become something and leave the past behind 
but never forget where you came from. She wanted true happiness and love, but she was going through all the growing pains that we go through to find it and voicing them all publicly. I could feel her pain, but she was definitely on the right track. In the summer of 2013, she was excited about entering her final year of high school. As a matter of fact, she was in the middle of planning her senior pictures. She was having them taken in August before the fall semester began. This is necessary so that you could get your picture in the yearbook. It used to take a while for them to process the pictures and get them ready for publication. I'm sure you know if you've been through it. I dropped out of high school, so I did not have senior photos, but I heard this from my best friend. It's something completely normal. Laura, Alexis's mom, agreed to gift her a trip to the hair salon in preparation, and Alexis had already picked out a style she wanted and made an appointment with a stylist out in Lynchburg for Saturday, August 3rd, after she finished working. She actually worked at a thrift store in Charlottesville on the weekends and during the week in the summer. And what I could tell is that Laura instilled a work ethic into Alexis. Laura worked at a local post office and sometimes she would put in overtime or work the night shift just to provide for her family. She didn't mind helping Alexis when she needed something, especially because she was a good student, a talented athlete, and did work her own job to get extra things that she wanted. Friday was filled with fun at a family barbecue and she hung out with her aunt Trina and all of her cousins. Alexis would routinely share her plans on Twitter with her followers. She let her community know where she was headed, like this post on January 16, 2013, off to North Carolina, after I clean my room. It was no different Saturday, August 3rd. She posted Bergbound, and after getting money from Laura for her hair, she headed out to work in Charlottesville and planned to drive to Lynchburg for that appointment when she got off. Her last tweet was at 3.40 p.m., she tweeted, I actually look cute right now. And then it's as though Alexis vanished. It was the next morning, Sunday, August 4th, when Alexis's grandma Gail went into her bedroom to check on her. But when she opened the door, Alexis wasn't in her bed. She wasn't home. Gail was the first person to realize that Alexis had never come home the night before. And that was unlike her. Gail called Alexis, but she got no answer. And that was a major red flag. Alexis would always answer. Always. Gail's very first thought was that Alexis could have gotten in a car accident trying to get to Lynchburg or back into town. And she was worried. Gail checked with Laura, who had worked the overnight shift at the post office and wasn't home yet. And she called her asking if she knew where her daughter was. And Laura was confused. She's like, what do you mean she didn't come home last night? Well, the white Nissan wasn't in the driveway and Alexis wasn't there. Laura called Alexis's dad, Troy, asking if Alexis had possibly gone to his place the night before, but Troy said, no, I haven't seen her. And they were both trying hard not to panic. But the fact that Alexis left alone, broke curfew for the first time and didn't return his car was frightening. And terrible thoughts started to fly through his head. The same would happen to me. I go to the worst possible scenarios when I don't hear from someone. Alexis was still not answering her phone and it seemed like it was off. It was going straight to her voicemail. And this was unlike her. Everybody knew Alexis would not let her phone die no matter what. She would plug in multiple extension cords just so that it could still be accessible while she walked through the whole house when it had to be charged. This was very unlike her. So Laura took Troy's advice he said to call the police. But instead of calling them, Laura went down to the Nelson County Sheriff's Department in person to explain what was going on and get this. The officers there had never filled out a missing persons report, never. This was actually the very first one they had ever completed. So this gives you a perfect example of how uncommon this was. This didn't happen in Nelson County. It took them longer than usual to figure out the process. And Laura just waited patiently, as patiently as she could, even though she had become more and more worried, especially considering she had contacted various family members and friends and none of them had seen Alexis since the day before. After the case was created, it was handed off to Nelson County Sheriff's Investigator William Everett Mays Jr. We're gonna call him Billy Mays because that's what he went by. He had never investigated a missing person until he was given Alexis Murphy's case. 
This really was his first rodeo, but at least he knew the first thing he had to do was get an understanding of who Alexis was and where she was last seen. So he started with interviewing Laura, followed by Alexis's family members, her grandparents that lived with her, her brothers, all her aunts and uncles, her cousins, to get as much information as he possibly could. He was dealing with a young woman, someone that he thought could have possibly wanted to disappear. This is an age where teenagers are transitioning into true adulthood. They test the waters of what they can get away with. And sometimes they make adult decisions thinking that they know it all. He thought that that's what they could be dealing with. Maybe Alexis didn't want to be found, but her family was adamant that that was not the case. No way. She overshared on social media. Even if it was her intention to leave her family, she would not have left her Twitter following out of the loop. That was another place Mays wanted to take a good hard look. But first, he focused on Alexis's family. Her aunt Trina told him that she was Alexis's great aunt and that Alexis was incredibly humble. She was a genuine person and she would not have let her phone die. She said the last time she saw her was that Friday at the cookout. The last thing she said to her was, I love you and I'll see you later. Alexis's cousin Jasmine Murphy said that Alexis would never have left town without telling anyone. She hung out with her on Wednesday, July 31st after volleyball camp. Alexis went out to Madison Heights with Jasmine to get Jasmine's eyebrows done, and then they went out for Chinese food together. And on the way home, they stopped at McDonald's to get a frappe, and then she dropped Alexis off at home. They texted on Friday, but they hadn't talked on August 3rd. Plus, Alexis was excited about her senior year. She was looking forward to playing volleyball and Jasmine had been the assistant coach for Alexis's team for two years. She saw Alexis grow as a player and she knew how seriously Alexis took the sport. None of the evidence that Mays is gathering at this point is leading him to believe that Alexis ran away from home. He knew that she had plans to get her hair done. When he called to see if she made it to that appointment, the stylist informed him that she did not. Meanwhile, Laura is taking matters into her own hands. She couldn't just sit around waiting and with modern technology, we can all do something. We can all be investigators. The internet is a very powerful tool. Laura knew that the iPhone had the find my iPhone feature on it. So they put Alexis's number into the app and they were shocked when a location pops up on the map. I can only imagine that mixture of elation and fear but mostly fear at this point because of where the location was. It was in an area called Oak Ridge, which was about a 10 minute drive from their home. But it's where Oak Ridge is that worried them right away. It's along a major highway called Route 29. And this is a corridor that passes through a very rural area. It's pretty much in the middle of nowhere and it's very well known as a place where a number of females have gone missing over the last few years. All of them were traveling alone when they disappeared. As you probably understand, Alexis's family, they're beside themselves. They're confused and they're scared, but they give all of this information to Investigator Mays. It's the first lead, and it came from the people who cared about Alexis the most. They were not going to give up. Actually, they were on the case faster than Nelson County Sheriff's Office because of social media. Everyone was reaching out on their respective platforms, whether it was Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, even MySpace, and posting about Alexis, asking the public to please give them any information that they can about her whereabouts or if they had seen her, please come forward. They were desperate for answers and they knew the more time that went by, the less likely it would be that Alexis would be found or alive. It's a race against time. The family quickly gets the media involved, which wasn't hard since this town is so small and this is such big news. The first missing persons case, a beautiful young girl vanishing out of nowhere. So the family holds a press conference begging for the safe return of their loved one. Her aunt Angela was sobbing and begging the public for help. She also put out a public message to her niece. She said, Alexis, Just know that we're working on bringing you home because we all miss you. It was a very emotional time for her family and now the community is coming forward to help in any way that they can. There were hundreds of people coming together asking, how can we help? How can we take action? The town is known as a place where the residents are friendly. 
They open their arms to anyone and everyone and everybody knows everyone. That can be a double-edged sword. They know you, so they care. But they know you, so they know all of your business. One of them could be involved. You never know. But the family would take any help that they could get. At this point, Nelson County investigators are searching the surrounding area. They're looking all around town for clues, but once they get that lead about Oak Ridge, their focus shifts. And Mays makes his way out there to where Alexis's phone was last active according to the Find My iPhone app. And when investigators are looking around, they don't see a car. That's the first thing they're trying to locate because they know she was driving the white Nissan. They don't see it anywhere in that area. But the thing about this area though, is that there are thousands of acres of land. And this phone was pinging near Oak Ridge Mansion. And this specific location is known for weddings and other really big events like that. And they realize that they're going to have to search this area and that it's a very small sheriff's department. So they call in volunteers from the area and there's a huge gathering. Everyone wanted to help. By 6.30 p.m. that evening, there was actually a state trooper helicopter in the air looking over this area for her car. Not only that, even though this is a small town, this was a big case already, especially with social media buzzing and her large following and the town putting pressure on the sheriff's office. The first FBI agent was actually on the scene by 7.15 p.m. on August 4th. When Alexis's family gets the word that her phone pinged off of Oak Ridge Mansion, that kind of puts up a red flag because they know someone who works at Oak Ridge Mansion. His name is Abraham Gray. He was actually the ex-boyfriend of Alexis's mom, Laura. Alexis had always looked up to Abraham. She saw him as a father figure when he was in her life and they got along great. He was very close to Alexis and her family. But of course, after he and Laura broke up, he wasn't as close or in communication with them. So they wondered, was Alexis still in communication with Abraham? Did she need something? Did she go there for help? What was going on? So they now need to find Abraham and ask him, when was the last time you saw Alexis? Abraham wasn't working at Oak Ridge Mansion when they came out there to search that day, but they do manage to track him down and ask him a lot of questions. The first one was, do you have anything to do with Alexis's disappearance? And he's like, no, I haven't even talked to Alexis. I have nothing to do with her going missing. I didn't even know she was missing. When they tell him when she went missing, he lets them know he wasn't even in town at that time. But investigator Mays thinks it's just a little too much of a coincidence. The fact that this person works there, he knows the family, there's a connection. So he digs in deeper. But with all the technology that they have, they're able to look at his phone records and they know where his phone was pinging that night. And it was in a completely different location. So they were able to clear him for now anyway. While these investigators and volunteers and the family are going through this entire plot of land, as beautiful as it was, this beautiful estate built in 1802 with these breathtaking views of the Blue Ridge Mountains, it's also a place that elicits a lot of fear in the family and the community, knowing just how vast it is. There's a lot of places for someone to go missing in this area, and not only that, there are fields, as far as I can see, but there's also heavily wooded areas like this with creeks and bushes and all kinds of wild animals. Things that would be very dangerous for a young girl. It's also a very secluded area. You could definitely get lost out there. If you were deep in those woods, no one would even hear you scream if something bad happened to you, especially if you were there against your will. And this is the main focus of the investigation at this point, because this is where the iPhone app said Alexis was located last. I mean, look at the bird's eye view. You can see just how vast this land is. Another thing I want to point out is that even though it was only a 10 minute drive, this was a drive that was out of the way from where Alexis should have been headed. The estate itself has over 4,800 acres. Investigators are thinking there could have been some kind of car accident. Maybe she went off the road. So they're looking everywhere in that area. But after a few hours and with all their expertise and even the FBI coming in, they start to brainstorm once again. They theorize they could be off track. Even as great as the technology is for Find My iPhone, 
And I think you might know what I'm talking about. It's not always 100% accurate. I know this firsthand, okay? I have definitely used the location services on my phone to locate friends, family members, and it's not always on point. It'll give you a vicinity, but they really feel like they're looking in the wrong direction. And at this point, the media is really starting to get more and more involved. There are stations coming from out of town at this point, and that is when the state police get involved. Now, unlike other cases that I've done about small towns, this is happening very fast. This is only one day, this is the first day of the search, and they already have FBI agents out there, and now Virginia State Police are coming out there to assist the search and to coordinate with these other departments to try to think of their next focal point. There is one big reason that this was such a big deal, and it had a lot to do with why this case got picked up, other than obvious reasons, which you may have already thought of, like how beautiful Alexis was. Some people don't like when it's mentioned that these cases snowball and get bigger and bigger when someone like Alexis is involved, someone who has that beautiful smile, someone with their whole life ahead of them, someone that you can imagine is like your own daughter, She's young, she's beautiful, with so much potential, but there's something else. She's not the only one. I mentioned this earlier, Route 29. That's the highway that Oak Ridge Estate is located off of, and there were a number of open and ongoing cases involving Route 29. Young girls just like Alexis had gone missing, and as a matter of fact, there was a suspected serial killer who authorities believed they were using Route 29 to capture his victims who were usually young women traveling by themselves. There are too many similarities to Alexis's case that the state has to get involved. A number of these mysterious crimes had happened in the past few years. And at last count, there were 32 young women and men that were missing on some portion of Route 29. And you know I don't like to go on tangents in my videos. That's why I make sure to write everything out that I'm going to talk to you about. However, when I do a case and there are other individuals that I feel that I should mention for the sake of getting their names out there and their stories, I will briefly do so. And I think it's really important in this case and it's definitely relevant and you will know why in just a second when I start to tell you what happened on Route 29. Since 1996, there has been a unusually high number of young women that have gone missing along this corridor in Virginia. Five women disappeared between 2009 and 2014. The person that the authorities thought was responsible was dubbed as the Route 29 stalker. That person has still never been identified. However, a man named Richard Mac Evanitz was a serial killer who was taking the lives of women in that area from 1996 until at least 2002. He was involved in the murder of at least three teenage girls. A girl named Sophia Silva and sisters Kristen and Katie Lisk, in addition to kidnapping a girl in South Carolina. However, investigators knew that Richard had nothing to do with Alexis's disappearance since he took his own life in 2002 when the police surrounded him in an attempt to make an arrest. So many people think the Route 29 stalker still exists, and witnesses have seen a man flag women down who were driving alone. But going back to Alexis, there were three recent unsolved cases that authorities were concerned may be connected to Alexis's disappearance. The first one was the murder of Morgan Harrington. She was a 20-year-old Virginia Tech student that went missing from a Metallica concert in Charlottesville in 2009. Her body was found on a farm on January 26, 2010. The second case was the disappearance of Samantha Ann Clark. She was last seen in Orange, Virginia, which was close to Charlottesville. She was at her home and she left a little after midnight. She didn't have a car, so it's suspected that someone came to pick her up and she was never seen again. And the last one prior to Alexis going missing was the case of Sage Smith, also known as Unique, who was a 19-year-old transgender woman last seen in Charlottesville on November 20th, 2012. She was on her way to meet a date. She was also never seen again. And now, just about a year later, Alexis is gone. And these cases are way too similar to overlook. There is a possibility that they're connected. And this is one of the major reasons why people think that the state police and all these other agencies got involved. Open cases that could potentially be solved as they investigate Alexis's disappearance. So as they're searching, these other women are on the top of their minds as well, 
and by noon the next day, Monday, August 5th, there were at least 80 agents from the FBI throughout the small town of Livingston, and soon there would be more. Over 200 investigators from different agencies would be working this case in just a couple days. Something else happened on Monday. It's when Alexis's volleyball team resumed their weekly practices, this time without number nine, their star athlete. They came together as a team to encourage one another to support Alexis's family and to pray for her safe return. Many of them were in shock, especially parents. They didn't expect something like this to happen in their community and a hashtag was started on Twitter and across all the other platforms, hashtag bring Alexis Murphy home. Her picture was everywhere. You couldn't get on social media without someone in the community reposting something about Alexis. Still, there was no sign of her, but something was about to be revealed, something big. A huge lead came in that very next day on Tuesday, August 6th. That evening, somebody called into the Nelson County Sheriff's Department with a tip. They'd been watching the news and they saw information about Alexis Murphy along with the description and the picture of the Nissan Maxima and a light bulb just went off in this person's head and they remembered seeing what they thought could have been that vehicle. They said that they saw it in Carmike Theater parking lot in none other than Charlottesville. And we've heard this city before. This is the one where all those other girls went missing from and now Alexis's car has said to be spotted in this town. I'm sure you know that the police get hundreds of tips all the time and they have to look into each and every one, but they're not getting their hopes up yet. However, if it really is her car, this could be big. This location was about 40 miles north of Lovingston and 70 miles north of Lynchburg. Yes, it's true. She worked in Charlottesville, so it wasn't completely out of the ordinary for her to be in that area, but they knew she was traveling to Lynchburg to get her hair done, so why would her car be at a movie theater parking lot when she had no plans, as far as anybody knew, to attend a movie that evening when she disappeared? On Tuesday night, agents, including Billy Mays, went to the Carmike 6 Cinema parking lot on Gardens Boulevard off of US 29. And sure enough, there it was, the white Nissan Maxima abandoned in this parking lot. The detectives circled the vehicle, looking inside, and they couldn't see Alexis or anything suspicious about the car from the outside looking in. But this is huge because the license plate matched WYN 3706, an exact match in the make, model, and license plate, but no Alexis. Well, no Alexis from what they could see by looking through the windows. They have something that they need to do, something that every officer dreads. They have to open the trunk. Statistically speaking, so many individuals are found deceased in either the trunk of their own car or someone else's. But they know they're gonna have to open it up. They're going to have to check it. That was investigator May's biggest fear. He thought he was going to open up that trunk and that Alexis was going to be inside. But when he opened it, he was shocked and surprised and also confused and relieved all at the same time she wasn't in the trunk. So where was she? Another thing that wasn't there was her phone or any of her personal belongings, just her dad's abandoned car at a place that no one expected her to be in the completely opposite direction of where she had an appointment to get her hair done. Detectives now have something tangible that they can look through, that they can fingerprint, that they can analyze, but they also have something else, a location. And with the location, they have one of their biggest most reliable pieces of evidence, and that is CCTV cameras. They know that the next day is going to consist of them going through every single business that's in that vicinity of this location and gather up all the footage from the day of August 3rd all the way until that person called in the tip. And they're going to go through hours and hours, hundreds of hours of footage until they find out how that car ended up in that parking lot and who was driving it. Was it Alexis? And if so, when did she get out of the car? Where did she go? This was huge. They thought it might actually solve the entire case by getting the right piece of footage. At this point, Alexis's family comes together and they create a Facebook page called Help Find Alexis Murphy. And the first post 
is on the next day, August 7th, and it says, new update. Investigators say they found several items of interest inside the car Tuesday night. After that preliminary search, officials sealed the car and towed it away so that they can conduct a more thorough search. Now, I wasn't able to find any information about what was found inside the vehicle. I did not find anything with thorough details, but the most important thing was that the detectives needed to scour those videos. And as they did, they finally found something. They spotted Alexis's vehicle pulling into that parking lot on Sunday night around 10 o'clock PM. But the video quality, like so many other cases that I have done, was really bad. When are we going to fix this? When are we going to be able to tell what something is right away? When is it going to be perfect night vision? But this was back in 2013. Okay. But they can't tell who is getting out of that vehicle. What they can tell is that the person gets out, walks out of frame, and it looks like they're walking into the woods. There's one thing that Alexis's family said, that isn't Alexis, because they know she's scared of the dark. They think there is no way she would park that late at night in an area like that and get out of the car and walk into the darkness. The sheriff's office decide to go get some canines to go to the car and see if they could pick up a scent. Maybe they can track the scent to where the person went after they exited the vehicle and guess what? The dogs do track a scent across the parking lot and into a nearby apartment complex. But something I wanna point out is that there is a lot of investigations going on simultaneously. There are investigators that are back in Lovingston, there are some in Charlottesville, and there are others that are doing a thorough search of her social media platform, which I'm definitely gonna have to talk about in just one moment. They're all trying to connect the dots and come back together and brainstorm about what they should do next, and that's exactly what they were doing that night at the car with the canines. They were getting together and here's a picture of all the different agencies standing outside that white Nissan Maxima trying to figure out what they're going to do next. So let's go back to the agents that were interviewing residents of that apartment complex where the dogs tracked the scent. Turns out there were no connections to Alexis in that nobody that lived there was connected to her as far as anyone being a friend, a boyfriend, someone she could have been hanging out with. And as they spoke to a lot of different residents from the apartment complex, they don't get any leads. There just were not any tips generated from that search. They really wanna figure out why the car would be there. One thing they really wanted to get to the bottom of was how long had the vehicle been sitting in this parking lot because the biggest thing for investigators is to build a timeline, a solid timeline, as solid as it can be of where Alexis was at what time throughout the days she had gone missing. If they could narrow that down, it would help them in so many ways. It's gonna help them with potential suspects. At some point, if they wanna compare, it's gonna help them with alibis. It's gonna help them with other locations and the connections of those as well. Remember that she went missing on Saturday. This car was pulling into this parking lot on Sunday night at 10 p.m. That's a lot of time. They've now expanded the search 30 miles south and 30 miles north of this car and they were even trying to pull camera footage from public transportation like buses. And after brainstorming, they get a new idea. But before I go into that direction, I told you we are going to dive into Alexis's social media presence, specifically her Twitter account. From the very beginning, her influence, so to speak, and the amount of followers that she had was pivotal in the search. Since there were so many people that kept up with her on a regular basis, some of them probably felt like they knew her and they would obviously notice if she wasn't posting and be interested in what happened to her. So from the very beginning, the word was spreading and fast. Once people were aware that Alexis was missing, some of the first clues that really solidified that Alexis was going to Lynchburg came from her Twitter, the tweet that said, Berg bound. Now the authorities that were initially investigating from the Nelson County Sheriff's Department, well, they didn't exactly know how to use social media the way that a teenager would. It was actually Alexis's friends and family that pointed out there's more than one way to look at what Alexis was tweeting. If you go to Twitter, you'll notice there's a tab that says tweets and naturally people will probably assume that means those are all the tweets from Alexis and that's true. Her tweets show up there as well as anything she retweeted from someone else. But there's another tab to the right called tweets and replies. In this section, 
you're going to find tweets from Alexis that she created, but you're also going to see tweets where she's replying to someone else that tweeted mentioning her. I know probably all of you know how to use Twitter, but for those of you that don't, this is what investigators were learning from her friends and family. This section that could give them a lot more insight as far as who Alexis was and who she was corresponding with. And that's the thing. The person that got out of that vehicle could be anyone. It could be any one of the 12,000 people that were actively keeping up with Alexis. And I say 12,000 because by the time investigators start to look at her Twitter, after they find that car, she's already gained 1,000 more followers. And they wondered, was one of them stalking her? Social media truly is a double-edged sword. It's what my senior thesis was about in college. I did an original research paper about the effects of social media and whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing in our lives. And that's the question. Is it our friend or our enemy? It's something I've thought about and that I really like to study because enemies can be lurking in the shadows behind keyboards in a dark basement, but next to you at the exact same time in the sense that they can follow your every move from afar. They can plan their evil deeds behind closed doors out of the sight of authorities and anyone else who can identify them because they come out of the shadows. It could be your biggest fan, someone that praises you every time you post, but it could actually be your biggest enemy. It wasn't that hard for me to figure out where she lived. It says it right on the top of her Twitter, right here on her profile. Nelson County. Considering there's only one main road going through Nelson County, it wouldn't be out of the question that a stalker might just wait there until they caught a glimpse of Alexis. She definitely stood out in a crowd. But if she hadn't added her location, I could have figured it out from posts that she made, like this one. The fact that I have to work tomorrow, that's July 31st, 2013. And just a day later, she says, Charlottesville morning traffic and rain. So you can put two and two together. It's pretty obvious. She's working in Charlottesville during the summer. Earlier that day, she said she was in Madison Heights. And not only that, she wouldn't have even had to post anything publicly. Someone could have been corresponding with her over DM. And we would never see it publicly. Or it could be, Someone slick is talking to her like they're her friend. And sooner or later, maybe she'll hint about where she works in Charlottesville. Maybe she'll give them her phone number. Or maybe she'll even agree to meet them. Investigators are thinking that this might have been the case because she even tweets about DMing people with her number when she's on her replies on Twitter. There's something else they notice. And before I say this, I have to tell you something. <laughs> There's a difference between victimology and victim blaming. Victimology is the study of the victim, including their patterns in their lives, their behaviors, where they hang out. And victimology is not just about finding out what happened to a victim in a particular case. It is also a study of how victims' behaviors can ultimately shape them into becoming vulnerable to becoming a victim. This is a science. This is something law enforcement uses. Now, criminology studies criminals' minds and victimology studies the minds of individuals who are victimized by criminals. A lot of times when someone would mention certain factors that may have contributed to a criminal mind wanting to target a particular person, people can see it as victim blaming. And let me tell you this, there is no one to blame for something happening to a victim except for the criminal, period. Nobody deserves bad things to happen to them, especially innocent people who are victimized and targeted. But one of the things investigators notice is that Alexis likes to show off the way that she looks, her physical appearance, and there's a nothing particularly wrong with that. We're proud of the way we look, and sometimes we like our outfits, we think we look cute that day, and we wanna show it off, especially when you're younger. But what might look cute to Alexis could look a lot different to someone who has a criminal mind. A predator is going to look at those pictures in a very different perspective. It's one of the reasons investigators theorize that she had so many followers and it's kind of hard to tell how old she is. Some may argue that a video like this one could have her appearing as though she's an adult when we know she isn't. I told you she likes to dance, but videos like this one could possibly give someone with a warped mind a different idea. And Lieutenant Billy Mays quoted 
It's a breeding ground for predators. But Alexis's aunt Trina said that she knew her niece and she knows how she was raised and she thought it was completely normal for teenagers. And I can understand where her aunt is coming from. Alexis was gorgeous. And unfortunately, some of the things she tweeted could have been taken the wrong way by the wrong people. Some of her pictures and some posts that other people created that she decided to repost with her own captions and comments could be looked at as worrisome because of her age. Because someone can look at her like an adult, but that doesn't necessarily mean that someone her age has the capacity to understand the dangers that are out there in the world, especially from a small town. Investigators just know they have a lot of work ahead of them. There really is no easy way to go through everyone that she interacted with. I know it took me a whole day just to read a lot of these tweets and get an understanding of who Lexus was as a person, let alone trying to track down every single mention, every single retweet, every single DM. And that is what investigators were working on. To reiterate, just because someone posts sexy photos of themselves doesn't mean that they're responsible for someone else's actions or someone's perspective, the way that someone thinks when they're looking at said photos. But it does allow investigators to understand potential dangers that Alexis could have opened herself up to. Remember, criminals target certain individuals. It's easy to see when reading her tweets that she's looking for someone to love her to make her feel special, to make her happy. So if someone can pose as all of those things, they could potentially work their way into her life and get close enough to hurt her. Her family doesn't want to see it that way. They talked about the fact that she was humble, that she didn't know she was beautiful, and that she was the type of girl who was loving and caring and innocent. And I know someone can be all of those things and still be portraying something different on social media that can be taken as something else. We don't consider it real life until real life and social media collide. That's when it makes these experiences real. There's something else they make as a connection on her Twitter, but before I go into that, I want to go back to the other portion of this investigation that I told you was going on at the same time. We need to backtrack because investigators are going through Alexis's Facebook messages and they find out she made plans with a guy in Lynchburg named Michael Hendricks on the night of August 3rd. They were supposed to meet up, and the two of them had been in contact for quite some time. From the content of the messages, the investigators concluded that they seemed really interested in one another and that Alexis was eager to come see Michael. So they track Michael down. He claims Alexis never showed up. He said the last time that he talked to her was around 6 p.m., on the 3rd of August, but that she ghosted him after that. Hmm, very interesting. Well, they dig deeper and Michael has a solid alibi for the past several days. And so he's ruled out for the time being. Meanwhile, as Billy Mays is working on her Twitter account, agents are combing through each and every one of her posts to find out where Alexis spent her time. Would there be any places she would have stopped on her way to Lynchburg that day? And there are other investigators working on where Alexis hung out. And they pinpoint the McDonald's and the Liberty gas station as a place that they need to look into and interview people who would frequent it, including the staff. It's also on her way to Lynchburg. So could she have stopped there before making her way out of town? That's their next focus. But first, on the evening of Thursday, August 8th, hundreds of people gathered to pray for her and her family in a candlelight vigil and it was held at the football field of Nelson County High School and everyone gathered around. They had candles in their hands. They shared stories about Alexis and of course the media was there to capture everything. It started to rain and people were just huddling under their umbrellas, continuing to sing and read scripture and to speak out loud to Alexis, saying things like, Alexis, we love you. There are generations of love represented here and we're going to find you. There were also several church leaders that were in the crowd and they were just encouraging everyone to hold on to their faith. That Alexis will be found and to draw strength from God and keep praying and keep spreading the word about Alexis until somebody comes forward with information so that they could bring her home. Alexis's classmate, Ramona Bryant, she passed out pink ribbons at the entrance to the field. Pink, as I said, was Alexis's favorite color and they wore it to support her 
and to keep her memory alive. The next morning, new information was posted on the Help Find Alexis Murphy Facebook page, and here is what they said they learned overnight. Investigators were pulling every surveillance camera along Route 29 corridor, trying to find anything that may tell them where Alexis Murphy was and when. Two, her cell phone was still not active. Three, the investigators have narrowed down a specific time frame for when her car was left at Carmike Cinemas. However, they did not release that to the media. Four, if the search continues, officials say they will likely begin to expand their search outside of the state. And five, they have already received tips from other states, but none of those have panned out to be anything. Six, for now, investigators are still acting under the assumption that Alexis is in Virginia. Seven, investigators acknowledge that they're not releasing a lot of information to the public, but they're asking everyone to please bear with them. And they say they're making progress and the case is moving in leaps and bounds every day. People also started passing around these posters and they were made by HelpSaveTheNextGirl.com. It's a nonprofit organization formed in honor of Morgan Harrington. She was that 20-year-old Virginia Tech student I told you about that went missing after a concert in Charlottesville. And their motto is buddy up, stay together, stay safe. Morgan's abduction and murder prompted the beginning of Help Save the Next Girl. They exist to spread information and promote personal safety. And this organization was founded by Dan and Jill Harrington, and those are Morgan's parents. Amanda St. Clair from Help Save the Next Girl made these posters for Alexis. They included the Help Find Alexis Murphy Facebook link, as well as a tip line and a description of Alexis. It also includes what she was wearing when she was last seen, a pink blouse and floral print full-length spandex pants, brown boots, and she was carrying a dark and light colored gray purse. Guess what? We're about to catch a glimpse of that. That's right. Because while investigators were trying to pinpoint the places that Alexis may have gone on her way to Lynchburg, they ended up at that location I spoke about, the McDonald's slash Liberty gas station, and they decide to pull the surveillance video footage. This is when the case takes detectives in a totally new direction because they finally catch a glimpse of Alexis Murphy. Employees of both the Liberty gas station and McDonald's knew who Alexis was. They knew her very well. She came in there every single day, like many other teenagers. And not only would she come in to get something to eat or fill her car up with gas, she hung out there. She was there for an extended period of time, socializing with other people. And it was around 7 p.m. that the camera catches her. Her car is parked at one of the pumps and she comes inside the store to pay for her gas. Everything seems pretty normal. She just seems to go right up to the counter, pay for the gas, goes back to her vehicle to pump it. The last known activity from her phone is at 7.17 p.m. So they had this 17 minute window and they were trying to figure out what happened during that time frame. They started interviewing the people who worked at both the McDonald's and the Liberty gas station. And people said she was happy that day. There was nothing out of the ordinary. She was smiling, being herself. But then when her family checked out the footage, they had a different perspective on the way that they thought that she looked. They said they thought she looked like she had a blank stare on her face and that she looked very uncomfortable, but it's so hard to tell. We don't always portray exactly what we're feeling and thinking. We could be stressed. She could have been trying to get out of there as fast as possible, get to her hair appointment. You don't know you're being filmed. You're not really playing up to the camera. I know from what I've seen online, yes, she's always smiling and bubbly, but we're just catching her in a mundane act of paying for gasoline. But now they know where she was last seen. This is where they're going to concentrate. Not only that, they're gonna pull all the surveillance footage from a week prior to her coming in the gas station and while she's in the gas station, as well as a couple hours into the night following that time that she's last seen. And they're trying to pinpoint whether or not anyone suspicious was around, if she had any weird interactions, if anyone stands out to them. There's also a car lot across the street, across Route 29. So they started looking through all of those cars as well because they don't know. She could be anywhere. It's like she walked out of that gas station and disappeared. The investigators were playing this short portion of the video over and over again, probably hundreds of times. And finally, something stood out to them. 
It's almost like you need to look at something again and again and again for something very small to become something very big. When Alexis was coming into the store, a man held the door open for her as she walked inside. This is usually meant as a courtesy to help someone out, a nice little gesture, a little friendly assistance, but because this was the only real interaction between Alexis and anyone that they saw coming and going from the store in the footage, it stands out and they narrow their suspect pool down. Now they start to question the gas station cashier, the one that was there when Alexis was checking out, and that clerk tells the detectives that there was some kind of conversation between Alexis and this man holding the door. According to this witness, it seemed like the two of them knew each other. But what's interesting is that this is a middle-aged man. This wasn't a young guy. This wasn't someone that Alexis would have gone to school with or hung out with on an ordinary day at Liberty Gas Station. He looked rough. He wasn't someone clean cut. And he certainly didn't look like someone that she would be interested in talking to or hanging out with. He just didn't fit the profile of, let's say, someone that Alexis was going to the gas station to deliberately meet up with. And the clerk does add something else. He said that this guy is familiar to him, that he comes in all the time. He recognizes him, especially by his distinctive vehicle. He drives a GMC Suburban with camo stripes on it. Now wait, before you say, no, 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 it's Chevy Suburban. Mm -mm, I have to correct you. GMC made a Suburban, which is now called a Yukon back in the 80s and the 90s. This is the vehicle, a GMC Suburban. This is what it looks like. It had a camouflage stripe going around the sides on the doors, a very distinctive. Another thing this clerk said was that this man had a tattoo of Daffy Duck on his neck. That is something they definitely would not be able to miss. This is their number one priority to track this man down. So the police take screenshots from the surveillance video of both Alexis and this unidentified man who held the door open for her. And they start to go around to all the businesses in this area and they start asking, have you seen this man? Do you know who he is? because he frequents this area. They also did this in Charlottesville because remember, that is where Alexis's dad's car was found abandoned and they actually get a hit. The place that they get this lead is none other than a local adult video store called Ultimate Bliss. An employee there says, oh yeah, I know who this guy is. He comes in all the time. The store manager goes ahead and gives investigators all of the security footage and it turns out 45 minutes before the interaction with Alexis, this unidentified man was in that adult video store. Oh, and it was definitely him. They could see the tattoo and everything. He had stopped at this shop to get some adult movies. He got a couple of them that evening and the manager went through their transactions for that day and they were able to give investigators a name, Randy Allen Taylor. Investigators immediately run Randy's name and get his last known address. You guys, it's only one mile from the Liberty gas station. It takes four minutes to get there. Now, if you've been here before, this is the part of the video, this is the part of the case where things start to speed up because everything is going to start happening really fast because they just pinpointed their prime suspect. They have nothing else to go on. So that's exactly who he is right now. And guess what road Randy lives off of? The 29. And Investigator Mays is already heading towards that property, getting all the other agents information so that they can meet him there. And when he gets there, or where he thinks the property is supposed to be, he doesn't see anything. He's looking at what we're looking at on the screen. All it is is just a bunch of tall grass and trees. He can't even see a driveway. He doesn't know where he's supposed to go. He just finally steps right through all of the brush and the grass, and he's able to see that there is a dirt driveway hidden behind all that. And lo and behold, there is the camouflage SUV. It matched the description of the clerk at the Liberty gas station. They also see that there's a broken down old camper on the property as well as a building, but the building is an old abandoned home that nobody lives in. Investigator Mays said he felt like this was something you would see in a horror movie, but this is real life. He walks up and he knocks on the camper door and sure enough, Randy answers. Investigator Mays tells Randy why they're there. He said, I'm here about a missing girl. Her name, Alexis Murphy. She's last seen at the Liberty gas station. And he shows a picture of Alexis. And Randy says he's never seen her before and that he wasn't at Liberty gas station on August 3rd. He was basically acting like he had no idea 
what they were talking about, but Maze has a feeling that Randy is hiding something because they know for a fact he was definitely at Liberty Gas Station, so why would he lie about that? That's when Maze decides to confront him with the fact that they have him on video and that he's holding the door open for her. So his demeanor changes and he lets them know, okay, yes, I was at the gas station. And without even asking him another question, Randy just starts to talk. And he starts to tell the investigators a story about how he met Alexis. He says he met her probably about a year ago at a local car wash he was working at at the time. And he had been smoking some weed and she came up to him and made a comment about something along the lines of, that smells really good. So when he saw her at the gas station on August 3rd, yes, he recognized her. He knew who she was, but he didn't have anything to do with her disappearance. Well, the fact that they have the surveillance video, plus Randy admits to knowing Alexis, this is grounds for Mays to obtain a search warrant for the camper. And this is when things are gonna heat up and I'm gonna tell you, I was shocked by this next part. It just blew my mind. I couldn't believe the things that I was seeing and reading and hearing about. It was too much for me to take in. It was just one thing after another thing after another thing. <sighs> Unbelievable. Something Detective Mays points out is that once you're five feet back off of Route 29 towards this guy's camper, you're in the shadows. No one would know that you're there. So they leave. They come back with the warrant and Randy is waiting for them in the driveway. He's not saying anything. He's just kind of just standing there. They also noticed that there's a video camera on the top of his camper, which was a little weird, as well as a spotlight on the front of his vehicle. As soon as detectives step into that camper, something catches their eye. Something shiny. And it's stuck inside the carpet. They kneel down and they pick it up and they realize it is a diamond stud. One single diamond stud. And as they're still looking around on their hands and knees, they locate a broken fingernail that is deeply embedded into the carpet. This place is a mess. There are things everywhere. You can't really tell what's evidence or what is trash, but they make their way to Randy's bed and one of the pillows has a long black hair attached to it. A root of that hair was still intact. And that means that it was pulled out of the scalp by force. It also means that they can find out whose hair it was with DNA. This is not good. This is horrifying already. And I'm sure you are making the connections, but there will definitely be more. And there will also be a lot of confusing aspects to this case and questions that will go unanswered for a long time. But let me get there. The investigators have seen enough at this point. They know how crucial it is that they get a DNA analysis done on what they have just found so far. So they actually get in touch with Quantico. This is the federal FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia, and they let them know we need a DNA analysis rushed. And the lab tells them we can get it done in 48 hours. And that's fast. This stuff usually takes weeks, if not months. And meanwhile, the investigators leave Randy's property and they head back to Liberty Gas Station because they want to know if there are any other cameras on that building. They know in their minds Alexis was in that camper. Why? How? They have so many questions. And luckily, there is another camera. And from this other vantage point, you're not going to believe what they saw. Honestly, it still doesn't make sense to me. And there are a lot of theories about why they saw what they saw. But they catch a glimpse of Randy's SUV on the 29 going towards his property and right behind his vehicle is the white Nissan Maxima directly behind him following him going north toward Charlottesville, not Lynchburg. Why? Why was she following him? Was she driving that car? If she was driving that car, why in the world would she be following a 48 year old man to his property? While investigators are still waiting on those DNA results, they search around Randy's entire property. There was just all kinds of garbage and trash, mountains of trash behind his camper. It's not easy to search through. 
There's really high grass. There's all kinds of ticks in there, but investigators are determined. They even brought in these special canines, and this was fascinating. I had never heard about this before. These type of canines literally specialize in tracking the scent of a specific glue that's used in the manufacturing process of cell phones. How insane is that? Because that was critical. They wanted to find Alexis's cell phone because they thought that that could provide a lot of evidence like, did she meet up with someone? Who was she talking to last? And after they brought those canines in, in about just like 30 minutes, they find her phone. It's literally 70 feet from where Randy's camper is located. Unbelievable. It's completely shattered too. It's broken and it's obvious that the phone had been broken on purpose. It's been destroyed for the most part, but they can still send that in for forensic analysis. Honestly, finding that iPhone was almost like closing the case for them, but it isn't closed yet. I'm gonna tell you that right now. But this is something they knew she would always have with her. It was her lifeline. Our phones are like part of us. We really don't go anywhere without them. They had enough to arrest Randy for abduction. And when they do, Randy acted as though he was completely thrown off guard. But it's pretty freaking obvious that Alexis was there. Even though they don't have that DNA match yet, they just know. But Randy has a story for them. Another story. And listen to this. He says, okay, I didn't want to be involved, but you're right. Alexis was here, but she wasn't alone. She was with, as he put it, some black guy. He said that her and this guy came to his camper to smoke some weed. And that's what they did. They came over, bought some weed, and then they left. And he said the last time he saw Alexis, she was completely fine. She left with this black guy with dreads. They said, do you have a name? And he actually does. He says that the guy's name is Damien Bradley. They're not really sure what to think about this because they know that Randy likes to tell stories. He likes to lie. They've already caught him in a lie. But they do go through Alexis's Facebook and sure enough, one of her friends is a man named Damian Bradley and he lives in Nelson County and it turns out he left town right after Alexis went missing. And now he's in Alabama. That's definitely a red flag. Could something have happened between Damian and Alexis? After Randy was with them smoking weed in the camper, did Randy leave? And then they stayed? They need to know more so they track down Damian Bradley. They find out he works at the local McDonald's that's attached to the Liberty gas station. And this is a pretty big deal because we know this is where she was right before she ended up at Randy's camper. So was Damian driving that car? Also, we know Alexis loves frappes and that she's always at McDonald's. Look, she even tweets pictures of McGriddles. Well, they do get to talk to Damian. They ask him about Alexis and he says, you know what? Yeah, we talked, kind of had crushes on one another. She would come in and I would see her, but I never hung out with her outside of work. And they're like, are you sure? And that's when they tell him the story that Randy gave about his version of what happened on August 3rd. And he says, that's a lie. That's all a lie. Is it though? Because after all, Damien definitely fits the profile of someone that Alexis would hang out with. Someone she might have trusted. Someone she knew since they talked each time they saw each other on a regular basis at McDonald's. And you might be wondering what Alexis's family thinks about all this. Well, they have their thoughts. It seems like any time weed was brought up, her family would make sure to mention that Alexis was a really good girl that she was very responsible, that she was the typical innocent sweet teenager, but that doesn't mean that she didn't like to smoke weed. However, I completely understand the stigma that existed and still does. As a matter of fact, a post was made on the Helpline Alexis Facebook page and it addressed this entire topic. Since social media is accessible to everyone and everyone was trying to help piece things together to help solve this puzzle, they saw pictures of Alexis smoking and they were apparently victim blaming. When no one knows the facts of this case, Alexis is not on trial, Alexis is the victim. Whether or not she did or didn't smoke, remember, victimology and victim blaming are different. Saying things like, see, smoking weed leads to associating with the wrong people, she should have known better, that is victim blaming. But saying something like, she liked to smoke, and this pervert most likely used this to his advantage, just like, you would offer kids candy. 
That's acknowledging how these criminals will find ways to work their ways into a potential victim's life. Here is the post that went up in regard to this on Facebook and it read, With all the comments being released from Randy Taylor today, I want to be clear about a few things. Alexis Murphy is not on trial here. She is the victim. Analyzing her Twitter and her Facebook accounts to pass judgment on what kind of person you think she may be is really unfair since she's not here to defend herself. Our main focus should be to help bring Alexis home and to bring those who are involved in her disappearance to justice. Thank you all for your support and prayers. What is even more important to look at and what didn't make sense was if she was going to an appointment all the way in Lynchburg, why in the world would she make this random stop out of the way to hang out with a guy, Damien, that she supposedly had never hung out with before, right before she's supposed to leave town to meet up with another guy, Michael, that she was interested in and actually made plans with. It just doesn't make sense. The timeline doesn't work for me. Plus, Damien has an alibi. August 3rd, he wasn't even at McDonald's or near Liberty Gas Station. He was actually donating blood around the same time that Alexis would have been at the gas station. The whole story that Randy gave about how Damien supposedly left McDonald's while he was working to go buy or sell or smoke weed with a complete stranger, it really didn't make sense. That's right, Damien said he never met Randy. What detectives already know is that not only did Damien and Alexis spend a lot of time at Liberty Gas Station and McDonald's, but so did Randy. That's probably where Randy saw Damien working behind the counter. And they now think that Randy's just trying to throw them off track. It's starting to look like they need to go back and look in Randy's direction. And as the case becomes more widespread, there are other people coming forward with tips, especially in regard to Randy. And one involves an Applebee's in Charlottesville. Someone comes forward with evidence that Randy came in on the night of August 4th, around 11 p.m. He ordered a couple beers and then he left in a cab. And guess where this Applebee's was located? Well, it's walking distance from the movie theater where the car that Alexis was driving had been found and seen on camera at 10.30. He left in a cab. What does that tell you? Well, circumstantially, it says he was the one driving that Nissan Maxima. And when Alexis's aunt Trina hears the name Randy Taylor and she sees a picture of him, she's shocked because she realizes she knows who he is. He used to work at a used car lot and she bought a car from him. <sighs> wow, I mean, it is a small town after all, but as people get word that Randy may be involved, more info starts to come out. Some people say they were very uncomfortable when they saw him at the gas station that he would sit in his SUV just smoking and watching people for hours. Ugh, it's probably young girls that he was looking at. So gross. They do go ahead and collect a sample of DNA from Damien just in case. Just in case they want to eliminate him 100% or just in case it turns out he really was in the camper. But speaking of DNA, well, you probably could have guessed this, but the DNA results are back. That was Alexis Murphy's strand of hair the one that was found on Randy's pillow. What is going on? Well, investigators think they know. That's when they make a little unexpected drop-in back at Randy's by the FBI this time. And he definitely didn't think that they were gonna come back. He thought that the search was over. And so he hid something after they left. They end up finding the shirt that Randy was seen wearing in the Liberty Gas Station video. And get this. It was balled up underneath his couch. Wow, great hiding place, Randy, but I'm glad you suck at covering up evidence. When they unroll this balled up t-shirt, a track of hair extensions fall out, along with two false eyelashes. What the actual F? But the worst part was all the blood. The shirt was covered in it so unbelievable and at this point authorities really want to up the charge from abduction to murder after everything they found and through experience they believe that sadly this is not a case where alexis was taken and got away or was released the extensions were pulled from her scalp they did not just fall out the broken nail the nose ring all of those things had to come off alexis in a struggle the problem is 
Alexis's family is holding on to the hope that she will turn up. A murder charge solidifies their worst fear, that she is dead. Plus, they haven't found a body. Usually we hear no body, no crime, but that is not how the prosecutor saw things. There were cases that have been tried in Virginia without a body being discovered, like the Stephen Epperly case. But he would need to sit down with Alexis's family and tell them that he didn't think she was alive and that they would agree to charge Randy with murder. I mean, her items with her DNA were found at this random stranger's house. She hasn't made contact with her family. Her phone is completely smashed. We know that's her lifeline. Not only did she miss a date with a guy that she had been planning to meet up with in Lynchburg that night, but she also missed a very important hair appointment for her senior photos. This wasn't like Alexis, but they had to convince her family that she was dead. That was critical to get the family on board. This is not just a legal thing. They were worried about not getting the family on board because how are you gonna charge someone with murder if the family is still adamant that she's alive? It was more about how this would affect the trial. If the family is still out there holding vigils and saying she's gonna come back, then they wouldn't be convinced that Randy killed her. And that's built in doubt before the trial would even start. If a jury thinks that Alexis's own family doesn't think she's dead, why would they convict this man? So they had to come up with a plan. They say, well, why not offer Randy a deal? Tell him, if you can show us where the body is, we won't give you life in prison. We'll take that off the table and we'll give you 20 years. And that's a really hard deal for them to make. But at the same time, I can understand that the most important thing is to bring Alexis home dead or alive. So the family agrees and they present this offer to Randy. Can't believe what he says. He says, give me 10 years and I'll tell you where she is. He's been sitting there saying he's innocent. So why is he acting like he now knows where she is if he didn't kill her? There's so much more to this. Don't leave, because I want you to find out what happens next. Randy's trial was set for May 2014, and meanwhile, the search is still on. Evidence is still being collected from Randy's property. And remember that abandoned building? Well, they go inside, and they find this weird scrapbook. It truly gives them a glimpse into this wicked, and perverted mind of Randy Taylor. There are all these cutouts of women with no clothes on and their faces are cut out of the pictures. And another person's face is pasted on top and guess whose face it is? Not Alexis's, but the daughter of one of Randy's coworkers. He is sick. Still, Randy is steadfast in his innocence. Well, remember Samantha Clark? I briefly mentioned that she lived close to Charlottesville back in 2010. She was 19. She lived at home with her parents and her little brother. She was home until midnight when she was apparently picked up by someone. Remember this? She told her brother she was going out and she would be back the next morning. But just like Alexis's mom, Samantha's mom worked the night shift and she didn't come back until the next morning. Samantha never returned. She left behind a pair of her pajamas on the bed and she took her house key. She didn't have a cell phone, so they weren't able to track her. Well, guess what? She was friends with Brandy Taylor. He was the prime suspect in her case, and investigators from her case had been in Lovingston this whole time, working out whether there were any connections between her case and Alexis. Samantha had started to hang out with a new group of friends the week prior to her disappearance, and one of those new friends was the then 45-year-old Randy Taylor. And it said that he would throw parties and invite young people to come over and smoke and drink and hang out. Through phone records, Randy Taylor was the last person that had contact with Samantha Clark. He called Samantha's house six times the night that she went missing. He even admits that he was the last person to see her. But he says he's not responsible for her going missing. Really? While all of this is going on, the girls volleyball team at Nelson County High School began their fall season without Alexis. They wore pink ribbons in their hair with her name and her jersey number, and it was touching. And it is a game. It's a waiting game. May 1st, 2014 was the first day of Randy's trial and still no Alexis. The search hasn't stopped. 
The Facebook and other social media pages were still buzzing almost every day with info and keeping Alexis on everyone's mind. The prosecution has a theory about what they think happened. They think Randy enticed Alexis, just like he'd done to other teens in the past with the promise of selling her some weed. He may have shown her some, which is where he could have pulled in that line that she said, oh, it smelled really good, like it's good quality, that type of thing. That could have happened that day, not a year ago at some car wash, because lies and the truth blend. His house was only four minutes away, and he could have used that as, you know what, it'll be really fast. I'll only live a mile away. They don't think anyone else was driving her car to his place, but they believe that once she arrived, she was either forced into his camper or she went in to retrieve the weed. But either way, they think that he became physical with her and ultimately forced himself on her and then ended her life in that altercation. Then they think he kept her body there on Saturday until he figured out what he was gonna do next. And then on Sunday night, he takes her to wherever he hit her. And then he drives that car to Charlottesville, dumps it in that movie theater parking lot, and then gets a cab back to his house. Alexis's family doesn't believe this version of events. They say there's no way that Alexis would have willingly drove out to his property. They think, that she was somehow forced there. During the opening argument, prosecutor Anthony Martin used the evidence that they found to paint a very gruesome picture of what they believe transpired in that camper. But the defense countered this with a theory that police planted the hair extensions and other items so that they could nail Randy because he was the suspect in those other disappearances and they just wanted to close those cases. But then, when that bloody t-shirt was revealed by the prosecution with her DNA on it, a mixture of blood, saliva, and other bodily fluids, <sighs> yeah, there was no body. But Anthony Martin argued, let's not reward a person by not convicting them just because they did a good job hiding the body. And I agree. After a five-day trial, just a few hours passed in jury deliberations when five men and seven women found Randy Taylor guilty. And as the jury's walking out before he's sentenced, Randy stands up and shouts, I'll take the original deal of 20 years and tell you where she is, but it's too late. He was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences, but he still maintains that he has nothing to do with Alexis going missing. And he even does an interview from behind bars. Here's part of that now. No, I did not kill Alexis Murphy or hurt Alexis Murphy. Do you know where she is? No, sir, I do not. And do you know what happened to her? No, sir, I do not. Wait. Something else happens. Something that makes prosecutors think they may have convicted the wrong guy. They think that maybe Randy had been telling the truth. Just two months later, police arrest a black man with dreadlocks. Recall Randy's description of the guy who he said came with Alexis to his camper? Well, the guy that was arrested is suspected serial killer, Jesse Matthew. In connection with two of the girls that I mentioned earlier, Hannah Graham and Morgan Harrington. Morgan is the girl that went missing after the concert in 2009 in Charlottesville. Her skeletonized body was found a few months later on a farmland six miles away from the concert venue. Hannah Graham went missing in 2014 after Alexis. It turns out, Jesse admitted he was the one that killed Hannah. The last time her friends had heard from her was a text message around one o'clock in the morning on September 13th, 2014. She told her friends that she was on her way to a party in Charlottesville, but she'd gotten lost. She was never heard from again. Well, authorities end up pulling surveillance video and they find out that she was at a restaurant called Tempo in Charlottesville. Guess who she was with? Jesse Matthew, who was 32 years old at the time. A witness at that restaurant said that Jesse was in there holding on to Hannah, and it looked as though Hannah was very intoxicated. And then someone else that was in that parking lot witnessed Hannah with Jesse, and they were next to his Chrysler Sebring, and this witness actually heard Hannah say, I'm not getting in the car with you. Jesse had already been accused of forcing himself upon women on two separate colleges he had attended in Virginia. Liberty University and Christopher Newport University. He left both of those schools after those allegations. The way they connected Jesse to Morgan Harrington was through forensic evidence that was taken back in 2009. 
it matched Jesse Matthew. And it turns out that Jesse interacted with Morgan the night that she went missing. Hannah and Morgan's remains were found only five miles apart. Jesse Matthew pleaded guilty to Morgan and Hannah's murders. And now Randy's defense attorney wants the state to look into Jesse as the person who was really responsible to what happened to Alexis. Well, they end up running Jesse's DNA against the evidence that they have in Alexis's case, and they're able to rule him out. It wasn't him. Nevertheless, Randy appealed his conviction, but it was denied. However, the case doesn't end there. Seven years later, on December 3rd, 2020, a body is discovered. It's located on private property off of Stagebridge Road along Route 29 in Lovingston, Virginia. At the time, it was not announced to the public. This location was only two minutes away, driving distance from Randy's property. It wasn't until two months later on February 5th, 2021, that they actually identified the body as belonging to Alexis Murphy. I have so many questions, but on the Help Find Alexis Murphy Facebook page, a post went up February 18th and it read, there are approximately 3,679,200 minutes in seven years. Alexis has been missed in each of them. We have spent them grieving the unknown and her presence while simultaneously trying to continue to find joy in life. While in many ways we are just truly beginning to start the grieving process, we also realize this means we can begin celebrating who Alexis was and the incredible impact she had on each of us in life and in death. Alexis's family also released this statement about her. Our family is so grateful for the continuing love, support, and prayers for Alexis and our family over the past seven years. While we have been grieving the loss of Alexis since 2013, we remained hopeful that she would be found alive and well. Alexis was the fashionista, athlete, and joker of our family. We were blessed to have loved her for 17 years and her memory will continue to live on through all of us. Our family would like to extend a heartfelt thanks and sincere gratitude to the citizens of Nelson County, the FBI, the Virginia State Police, the Nelson County Sheriff's Office, and all of the search and rescue teams for your commitment and unwavering support to find Alexis. You all kept the promise made in 2013 to bring Alexis home. The family added that during this difficult time for everyone to lift their family up in prayer. And in the words of Alexis, keep hope alive. A memorial service was actually held for Alexis on what would have been her 25th birthday and her aunt Trina had this to say. My niece was beautiful and humble. She was abducted from a small rural town in Virginia in the middle of the day with daylight still outside. I hope young people and their parents watching will be more cautious and more aware of their surroundings. Pay close attention to your children. You can never be too careful. And it's true. This can happen to anyone. Please be careful. You never know who could be watching you or your innocent children. And I love your thoughts on this case like I always do. I think that's all I have for you today. Thank you so very much for watching. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.